Many of you know that Birch has been doing our Perspectives in Ocean Science talks for quite some time, and I always look forward to this, the Keeling Lecture, which is a highlight of the year of our, of our series. So we have a special speaker this evening, and I'm going to invite up Sasha Gershinoff to invite our very special speaker. Sasha? Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, Ralph asked me to step in this time because apparently he feels that uh, scripts should uh, uh, be, you know, own this event more and, uh, and, and that the Killing family should somehow be in the background. I have a hard time imagining uh, how uh, this event could ever be separate from the, from the Killing family. And, uh, so I have a tendency to go off on tangents, so for once I actually wrote down some remarks, so I stay short. And I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging the legacy of Charles David Keeling, whose uh, painstaking work in observations and uh, synthesis basically laid the foundation for, a uh, factual foundation for what we understand about uh, uh, human-induced climate change. And uh, his decades-long observational record that bears his name, the Keeling Curve, transformed our understanding of human-induced climate change from theory to fact, uh, inspiring and empowering generations of uh, climate researchers. So each year, this lecture series brings a prominent member of the global change community to Scripps to speak on topics that reflect the legacy of uh, Charles David Keeling. And the talk you're about to hear represents a departure from uh, previous lectures that focused mainly, mainly on uh, the physical aspects of climate change and its impacts. Uh, and this year's speaker, Dr. Suzanne or Susie Moser, uh, works on the less tangible but possibly most important aspects of the problem, the social and psychological impacts. Uh, Susie is tackling the frustrating question of knowing what we know about climate change factually, what do we do with this information essentially as human beings? Um, and so when people ask me what I do for a living, um, and I explain that I'm a weather and climate researcher, uh, they almost invariably follow with the question, uh, do you believe in climate change? <laughs> uh, to which, I typically answer, I don't have to believe in it. I have evidence to know that climate change is real, and uh, I know it's a fact. But actually, um, when I met Susie a few months ago, and I heard her talk for the first time, and the only time so far, um, she actually made me realize that my response is inadequate. Um, and basically, uh, that it's perfectly reasonable for a scientist to respond that way, but it's inadequate for a human being, is what I realized for myself. Only after we start believing in what we know, as Susie had put it, we, we can start to process the information on a deeper personal level and mount an adequate human, moral, and fair response to the immense objective problem at hand. Uh, and so Susie comes to us from Hadley, Massachusetts, where she is director and principal researcher of a one-woman show, um, the Suzanne Moser Research and Consulting. Um, and uh, she's also affiliated with, uh, she's affiliated faculty in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, she's a research faculty at the Environmental Studies Department at Antioch University in New England. Uh, Susie is a geographer by training with a PhD from Clark University with interests in how social science can inform society's responses to the existential challenges arising from the climate crisis. She has worked in coastal areas, urban and rural communities, with forest-reliant re communities, and on human health issues. Um, before we begin, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for being here. 
and also big thanks to Harry Helling, Dana Shapke, and Cheryl Peach for, uh, and others at the aquarium for uh, organizing this event, and especially to the Keeling family for making it possible. So Susie, thank you for accepting our invitation, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Is this a good position? Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much, Sasha, for that kind introduction. It always feels heartwarming to know that, you know, sometimes your impact is on a colleague um, rather than on, on the broader public, but let's see what we can do together this evening. Um, before I get started, I also wanna just simply say thank you to the Keeling family for making this possible and for actually taking a chance, this entire committee, to take a chance on a social scientist, um, you know, given that I do not directly carry forward um, the legacy of your husband and father. So really uh, a great um, honor to be here and thank you to the Birch Aquarium for hosting it. It's just an incredible, um, you know, location and, and just what happens here, what we do here. Thank you. Um, I guess I feel particularly humble, humbled and honored um, that you have chosen to break with tradition, as you said, to um, pick a social scientist. Um, it's in my line of work to understand what does climate change mean to us? What do we do about it or don't? do about it. Um, and as you will see, some of our lack of um, action on this topic is actually resulting in profound impacts on us very personally, very directly. And I guess that puts the question for, to, toward us, what does that, what's the impact and the challenge um, included in, or involved in that? Um, I guess to get us going into my topic, um, I was thinking, how would I start this and how would I make the, the curve, if you will, the arc from Dave Keeling's work um, to my work? You know, we both put our hands, if you will, on the pulse of a certain atmosphere. <laughs> he on the chemical, I on the psychological and the social um, atmosphere in which we live. I'm not going to push that too hard, but I am going to use his curve to introduce the topic and also the work that um, brought me here. So let me start it. You all know where that curve goes. I'm just going to say I was about 10 years in, into when I entered, um, the curve was about 10 years in. So that's when I started to contribute my share to the CO2. What you see 85 is when I, the first time I heard about climate change and was absolutely fascinated and in fact, I believe it was actually around that time when I began to hear the first, um, first time about a Keeling curve, that there was someone measuring what's happening. It was really one of our first um, factual pieces of evidence. What you see now, the next one, 97, is when I um, did my dissertation um, and I had gotten really interested in a different kind of curve, namely the global sea level rise curve. Um, and that too is an empirical curve. However, at the time, I was really, really interested in how is it that some states are acting, not just on, on the historical fact of sea level rise, but are acting on the projections of sea level rise. At the time, they were extremely uncertain. They were anywhere between 20 centimeters over the remainder of, um, or, or over the 21st century to six meters. 18 feet. <laughs> that was essentially the, the, the breadth of, of projections. Huge uncertainties. How is it that sometimes in the face of uncertainty we act and sometimes we don't? That was what I got really interested in. Now we're jumping forward um, to 2015 and um, that of course is the year of the Paris Agreement when at least the world came finally together um, to you know, at least promise to act on climate change. Where that's going is a different question, and you see where we have landed. This is where we are today. And over the course of my lifetime to date, we have a 100 parts per million difference in 
in the atmospheric CO2, and that is about as much as it ever changed between one glacial and an interglacial. That's rather remarkable, right? If you think about that sort of scale. And interestingly, in 1969, I believe it was, um, he said this in a talk. In 30 years, if present trends are in any sign, mankind's world, I judge, will be in greater immediate danger than it is today. Now that's prophetic. 1999, 30 years later, this was one of the most expensive hurricanes in American history at least, Hurricane Floyd. You might not remember that, but you probably remember this. Sandy, right? At that point, more Americans died than had died in a hurricane since 1900. In Galveston, that was 6,000 people died. In this particular event, only 3,000. I put this one out here. It was not a disaster, if you will, by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Um, however, that is a really important date for me, and I will tell you um, in a moment why that is. But that's when Al Gore essentially made his case um, for you know, why we needed to act very rapidly on climate change and try to popularize it. Well, we didn't act very strongly on that. I don't know if you remember 2009, COP15 in Copenhagen was a complete disaster in international climate policy. We did not do much at all. And a few years later, we had Sandy. I'm just putting out a few, a handful of events just to kind of give you a sense of what the danger is that Charles Keeling actually predicted, if you will, 30 years prior to that, or by now 40 years prior to that. And I could give you a very long list, all the way to the most recent history here in California, but many of you might have lived through um, with the flooding all over and it's not done given the snowpack that still has to come down or any of the other kinds of disasters that have happened over the last few years, um, the extreme heat. Of course, one of the things that has happened in the meantime is, you know, you can say, well, we've always had heat waves, we've always had storms, all true, except that we're moving outside the range of the familiar in terms of frequency, intensity, how expensive they are because there are many more people, many more things that we value in the path of hurricanes, so they get more and more expensive. And um, they're really, by now, we can actually say something about how much climate change is contributing to causing these events. So the science has tremendous, um, tremendously advanced. The other thing that we're noticing is this, that those who are most directly and most severely impacted are those who have the least means to protect themselves against it. So climate change is not just you know, the same for everybody, right? It is, there's extreme differences in vulnerability and the capacity to adapt to it. One of the things that we um, are now seeing increasingly, and I'm quoting here the IPCC, is that as a result of these events, we see climate-related illnesses, premature deaths, malnutrition in all its forms, and threats to mental health and well-being increasing. And as always with IPCC, it puts a confidence interval in it, and very high confidence is about as good as it gets in the IPCC. So this is a global phenomenon, not just here in the US. I'm gonna focus in much of my talk now on the US, just to kind of put it um, in context we all are really familiar with, but the issues are actually worse in many other countries. So this is what we're beginning to see. And I'm gonna focus on these mental health impacts in what comes next. What we're, you know, what we're beginning to see, and we have increasing studies and theory and, and empirical evidence of it, um, is how, for example, severe weather, of course, causes injuries, fatalities, and direct impacts. It's traumatizing to people to go through these events. If any of you here in this room have gone through any of these um, impacts, these events, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, also, uh, mental health impacts related to the broader set of environmental degradation that causes people to have to leave the place that they call home. Migrating to other countries, migrating from the coastal zone to higher, higher land, um, or migrating from, say, 
wildfire areas into less wildfire prone areas. So, you know, we're experiencing it in, in many different environments. Um, less well understood, although that is growing. And I know Sasha and others here have worked on this heat related illnesses and deaths, cardiovascular failures, um, many different pathways to dying or from being um, hurt um, by extreme heat. The part that's less well documented is that uh, extreme heat also causes people to be more aggressive. And um, if you are dependent on psycho, um, you know, some kind of medic medication, whether it's for heart issues or for mental health issues, um, you're much more prone to experiencing these kinds of uh, impacts. So there's direct and in indirect impacts on mental health. And of course, there are also the secondary and tertiary mental health issues. Aggression I just mentioned, PTSD, something post-traumatic stress disorder, something that lasts for years, can last for lifetimes, um, and can be transmitted even through generations. People drink more during those kinds of uh, events. Um, one of the things that I like to um, point out, and I've um, spoken to this in other contexts, Oftentimes, I, I've um, had this conversation with a friend of mine who works in um, domestic and sexual uh, violence prevention and uh, women's rights and, and women's protection. And one thing we like to exchange or almost quip about, um, and I put that in inverted comma, is every time a storm hits, another man hits a woman. It is really intense how um, domestic violence and abuse of children, of women, goes up during those events. And I want to add to that, that those things, again, are not experienced equally among the population. Um, when you have already experienced centuries of racism, of poverty, low wealth, low income, you have other medical conditions. Maybe you're older or a particular you know, young children. Um, if you live in a community that is a poor community, doesn't have adequate in infrastructure, all of these events are more likely to be more damaging to the communities. So in other words, the mental health impacts are likely to be worse for communities that have a, a long history um, of, ment of, of uh, marginalization um, and inadequate care, inadequate inclusion in decision making. This is the result. This is what you've probably seen in the newspapers appear over the last few years. Um, grieving, a changing climate, eco-anxiety, climate grief, how do we heal the emotional trauma? That's what's now in the newspapers. Sort of, it almost, and I say this um, with you know, great care because COVID was so terrible for so many of us, but it almost is as if COVID allowed us to finally also name the grief and the anxiety and the pain that comes, emotional pain that comes with climate change. Um, it seemed to somehow coincide so what I want to do in the rest of the talk is, you know, take this, this is sort of what happens in the general population and what all of us might be exposed. Um, but I want to focus us a little bit more on a particular bracket of the population, if you will. And that particular bracket is people who on a daily basis work on climate change. You know, those of you in the room that have other jobs, I'm not saying that's unimportant at all, but you can come here, hear me talk, hear somebody else talk, you can put it away and you don't have to think about it, right? Until you hear another news article or something shows up um, in, you know, in your life, maybe something happens, maybe some family member experiences something and you hear about it. But you have the choice of essentially putting it away for some part of the time. What about the people whose day job is to look at it again and again and again. For example, think about, I want to make this a little interactive and we're going to get to um, something more interactive in a moment, but imagine this gentleman. He is looking at a storm coming in, this is Sandy, um, and he lives somewhere in that metropolitan area of New York City with kids at home. What do you think that's like? You're telling everyone in the world, you know, why don't you go to higher ground, take shelter, and <laughs> this is happening. Um, what about this woman? She reported on, you probably recognize this, 
This is Paradise, California, right? When it burned down completely. And she reported on that. Imagine this woman going home that night. What was her dinner conversation like? Did she talk to her husband or her kids to what about happened at work today? Probably not, right? Because you don't want to bring that home. That's really hard. Or think about this young lady. You might, you might remember what it was like in, um, during COVID. It, the lockdown started to happen in March. And then the first summer, we had all kinds of hurricanes happen. And, all, and this was before we had vaccines. And all of a sudden, all these people you know, that were prone to get COVID had to go to evacuation centers. <laughs> right? So you're combining the two risks. Nothing happens just it's not just climate change, it always is something else, right? As I was saying, the confluence of racism and poverty with climate change, in the same way, it's you know COVID or any other crisis. It's never just one thing that affects people. So think about what it was like for her, putting herself at risk in that very moment. Or the people who come in after the disaster. I want you to think about what it's like for this woman that looks pretty sweaty and hot and exhausted already. She has one distressed person after another coming in to fill out paperwork, right, to get help. What, is, what are the, what's the, the scene for them? They have no food, they have no security, no shelter, no fresh water. They lost all their possessions. School can't, kids can't go to school. They probably don't even have a job to go. That's who comes and sits in front of you and has to fill out paperwork, right? People tend, at least I'll just speak for myself, I'm not very good at that. <laughs> when I have to you know, deal with bureaucracy, when I'm under stress, I'm sorry for all the people who are on the other end of that. Um, during a workshop, um, a scientific workshop called the Natural Hazards Workshop, there was a, 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 an event, a panel discussion on the increasing burnout crisis among first responders. This was just one of the, the graphics I found to support that. People talked about first responders as critical infrastructure, critical social infrastructure, right? We all rely on it as just as much as a road or, or water coming out of the tap. Well, they, sh they are essential, but they shouldn't be sacrific sacrificial, if you will. And at the same time, this article came out. FEMA experiences a mass exit of employees amid surges in disaster. I want you to think about what that means. If you're in a disaster and FEMA doesn't have the people to help you get back on your feet. Where do they all go? Well, they take other jobs, right? They work on something else. But they, the most experienced people, knowing what it's like to live with climate change, live through one of these events, are essentially not there anymore. Think about teachers, what it's like for them to sit in the classroom and essentially have to teach kids in the, in the room what their future is like. Think about ministers, because where do we all go when we have deeply existential questions? We go to either a therapist or the minister, right? That's where we end up going. Well, I can tell you that these people are burning out. And it is, again, I emphasize it, it is not just climate change. It is the other stresses on them, the lack of resources, the you know, stresses from all sources. And still, this is, this is, those are people who work, in my mind, on the front lines of climate change. Let me turn to climate scientists. There's probably quite a few of you here in the room. Here is one quote from um, a, an ecologist, Camille Parmesan. Maybe some of you know her. I don't know of a single scientist that's not having an emotional reaction to what is being lost. It's gotten to be so depressing that I'm not sure I'm going to go back to this particular site again because I just know I'm going to see more and more of it dead and bleached and covered with brown algae. There's a project that some of you might, have, might know about or you might be interested in. Um, it is called, Is This How You Feel? And it is handwritten letters from scientists who you all you know, may know highly reputable people um, who've made their names, you know, with their cre credibility intact, and they have written letters to someone in the future to say, this is how I feel about climate change. It's quite risky for scientists to do that, um, because we are potty trained 
to leave our emotions aside, right? Some of them basically are fed up enough, they just are basically ready to go on strike or to not participate anymore in just putting out more data, more data, more data, with nothing, no, not, nothing significant enough happening. Or think about this scientist. This is a gentleman, a uh, climate um, meteorologist, or a climate scientist, actually, of the uh, state of Alaska, Rick Toman, um, who at one point said in front of the camera, what will happen to you in the lower 48, that, that's all of us, is already happening to us here in Alaska. And I happened to interview a marine biologist about climate change, and she got really quiet, and she really started to yell at me. And she said, climate change? Are we still talking about climate change? Climate change doesn't capture what's happening here. We're dealing with system collapse, a complete shift. It is impacting everything, culturally, ecologically, economically. Now read again what Rick Toman said. What will happen to you in the lower 48 is already happening to us here in Alaska. How do you go home knowing that? Well, there is, thankfully, finally, a growing recognition that climate scientists actually perform an enormous amount of emotional labor, right? They come in front of the camera, speak to the public, and are like stone-faced, you know, and have essentially no, um, no emotional reaction. And some of us are getting really like, really? You're telling us all of this and you don't have any emotional reaction to this? Well, if Camille Parmesan is right, they all do, but they hide it. That, that hiding, that is emotional labor. I'm gonna play for you a mom in a moment um, something that, um, that speaks to that um, and how I process that. So I'm gonna make this a little more personal. Um, I was asked a few years ago by a French filmmaker to participate uh, in a documentary called Once You Know. Um, and he basically was faced with dealing with the knowledge that he was absorbing from his graduate studies. And he basically wanted to see and hear what scientists are not just thinking, but feeling. So let me quickly switch to that and play it to you. Um, We play, we laugh, we have been blessed. I left my American life behind to seek refuge in this French mountain village. But my worried mind spoils it all. I leave home, I go meet scientists, hoping they're in a struggle will help me make sense of my own. I often tell people that I live in a sort of practical day-to-day -day denial of climate change because it is unbearable. To know what I know is unbearable. Un des gros problèmes auxquels on est confronté aujourd'hui, c'est que on a énormément de mal à se représenter à un monde où il fera plus chaud. This is something big we're living through, and it's profound. In some ways, this is what might be thought of as toxic knowledge. Once you know, you can never be the same. Increasingly, it will be a fortress world. It's about sacrificing more and more of the world in order for a few people to continue to live. Climate change is a huge manifest injustice which will drive many people to take all kinds of action which nobody will have control over. I was for a very long time struggling with one question. What is meaningful work on the way down? What's important, what's good, what's meaningful, it's, it all needs to be reassessed. To confront this terrifying reality we're talking about is in, on a much grander scale, like confronting your own ending. And I think that's what we're asked to do as a human species, to confront that vulnerability. And in the face of it, 
become more alive and to meet each other in that vulnerability. And you better turn around and see that sky. <laughs> could collapse, not be the end, but the beginning of our story. The Earth is still here, brimming with life. I'm deeply convinced collapse awareness has the power to shake up our generation, a generation stranded in a state of political limbo. We must start believing what we know and acting upon our beliefs. But first, our predicament must be named. This is the story I want to tell. I'm going to stop it here. So I'm not showing you any of this um, as a way to get any sympathy for us um, who deal with this on a daily basis. I actually want to take this a step further um, and give you a little bit more of a sense of others who are facing with this. And those people touch your very lives. Um, and that's why it matters. Local officials. This is, again, Paradise, um, the town in California. Um, as you know, it burned completely down. And the people in charge of helping everyone who lost their homes in that fire to find a shelter, find a place to put their kids to school, find food, every single one of those people, the mayor, the city council, the staff, they lost their houses too. So in that very moment, where they're supposed to help the most stressed, you know, in the most stressful situation, helping other people, they themselves are in that very same boat with them. Or people whose job, whose day job it is to tell you about what's going on with climate change and to engage you in what are we going to do about this here locally. So this is a picture of Charleston, South Carolina, where um, this colleague of mine who I'm going to have her speak in a moment where she lived. And um, at the time when she left um, the Charleston in 2019, there were 80 days when the downtown was flooded. This is not during storms. This is high tide, you know, just what we call nuisance flooding, right? Not storm related. It's simply as a result of sea level rise being particularly high during certain lunar during the lunar cycle, and this is what downtown looks like. And what she said is this. I'm giving three talk in the next week on climate change and sea level rise in South Carolina. Given recent flooding, that's really important, I guarantee I will be talking to a lot of people already highly anxious and worried. I'm afraid that no matter how carefully I craft these talks, I'm going to have people going to that traumatized place. I normally love speaking to people and getting them engaged on those things but I'm just dreading next week. You know, when you go to communication school to learn how to do this, you don't learn about trauma-informed communication, right? So here they are with the best intentions, very likely to actually re-traumatize the very people that she's supposed to help. Or this is an exchange with a different um, extension professional. And um, we had just shared with each other an article that came out, I believe it was in 2019 as well. Um, and it actually talked about the growing suicide rate among firefighters. And it was, came in the LA Times because it had mostly to do with California firefighters. And in that article, there were certain passages um, that you know this colleague highlighted and then she just, in the email exchange we had, she just replaced certain words to kind of say, yeah, and this is how it is for me. So what I'm going to quote for you is that first line is from the article, and the second line is the redux. So when people call 911, they want someone there who's going to be brave and heroic and handle the situation. That was the original quote. And then she replaced it with, when people call Sea Grant, they want someone there who's going to be clear-eyed and objective and handle the situation. And the next quote, it's the original quote in the article says, it's chronic repeated exposure to everyone's worst day. And she replaced it with, it's chronic repeated exposure to everyone's raw and unfiltered existential dread. That's, that's the daily work, okay? 
Or think about these folks. So what you see on the left-hand side here is our staff try to build trust in the community to build resilience, right? Because this is oftentimes in the adaptation field, it's predominantly white privileged people who work for cities and then they get, you know, they finally make it in the communities to build trust and, and try to, you know, bring in the, the most vulnerable, the most marginalized into these conversations. And then something else happens next door. Another city department is killing the very people they're trying to build trust with. And I'm not saying this lightly, right? Police violence, we've all had it on TV in excess. But that's, what's, that's the context in which people are trying to make connection with the people who live in these communities. It's incredibly hard to keep doing this when this happens. It's not unrelated because it's the same neighborhoods, the same people who we're trying to reach or who are being hurt. There's a conference every few years, every couple of years, the National Adaptation Forum. Um, and there was a photo project done a couple of years ago in which these adaptation professionals that you see depicted here, um, one of them in particular is uh, on the right-hand side, um, Kelly is from California. Um, they were asked basically of how do you deal with this? And they wrote on that little chalkboard here and I just highlighted it a little bit more so you can read it more uh, clearly. How can we know this and do nothing? Will you forgive us? How do we help each other grieve so we can move forward with revolutionary action? That is how they feel about their work. I've had a private conversation. I've been in this field now since 1992 or so when I started working on adaptation and know a lot of the people in the field. People trust me, take me aside at those conferences and they say, can I just have a talk with you? How do you deal with that? I get this question again and again. And this one here is particularly um, telling and making the point of why it's important to you. So basically, you know, this is a conversation after just downloaded essentially how she's feeling and how she herself feels incapable and traumatized. She goes, so where does one go for treatment of this type of blank? I'm not going to say it. And I want to pause here to say there are a growing number but still an incredibly small number of climate aware, climate conscious psychologists. Imagine you're sitting in front of a psychologist and you wanna tell them about what worries you about this. And the psychologist is trying to just talk you out of it. That's ah, not so bad, come on, do a little meditation, you'll be fine, <laughs> right? Like that psychologist probably hasn't thought yet about what it is that they themselves are facing. It's in the community where they too are going to be affected by the climate impact. So you don't want to go to someone, as a, in, in our line of work, you don't want to go to someone who has not thought about this very, very deeply, right? So the quote continues, I don't have the energy to deal with all this pain and also keep up emotional barriers and boundaries right now. So I'm just hiding as much as possible. I mean, do I need to change reconsidering my career? That's the important part for you. Why? Because the most highly experienced people who've been in this for a long time are burning out and are essentially feeling ready to leave their jobs. Opening it up to people who have not as much experience, who are coming in fresh, right? who are still enthusiastic, but who are not experienced. That's what affects every one of you. If we have a bunch of rookies in those positions, good luck for us. So. That's what they face, being pulled and pressured from all sides, problems coming faster and faster with climate change, crises of the day can pull them away from the climate crisis. So COVID is an example. When people whose day jobs is to work on climate or sustainability, you have COVID, you're, you basically put that on the shelf and you are working on COVID. Understandably so, that's the people we have, but that just means we are not dealing with the other problem, the other big train coming down the tracks. All these legacies and intersectionalities, they're unavoidable, they're actually essential, and they are, if you will, sites where people can do some healing of all these old, um, you know, really horrifying ways in which we have treated each other um, from positions of power and privilege. And one might argue that, you know, they have 
the same root. We can talk about that. In any case, this is what people are coming to and are understanding, but they're, the learning curve to do that well is incredibly steep, and I include myself in that. I you know, have various of my own um, lack of privilege, but for the most part, I'm well-educated. You know, I can pay my bills. I'm privileged, so I don't, and I'm white. So I don't understand most of what it's like for people of color and how they have lived through centuries of being marginalized and, and dismissed. The adaptation profession in particular, people who help to prepare for climate change is women dominated, interestingly enough, at least, at least until recently. Um, and during the pandemic, um, most of those women felt a double or triple burden of you know, dealing with COVID, teaching their children, whatever. You, you all know that, right? That's not unique to them, but that's certainly um, an added um, piece because it's so women dominated. And of course, there is the growing split that I just mentioned with that example of you know, one department is trying to build trust, the other one is destroying it, right? That the politics and values of the organizations they work with are often not in line with what they most um, believe in and want to do. There's political resistance, not enough funding. Um, there, if you're working in a technical profession, your credibility is on the line if you ever want to talk about any of these things. Emotions are taboo in most workplaces, um, whether it's in academia or whether it's in, in government. Um, many of the people I work with are afraid to talk about this publicly because it's just spreading doom. Um, and we have such an obsession in this country anyway with some oh, it's going to be fine, you know, these sort of easy hope um, assurances that we increasingly can't believe in. Um, but they are the public face of climate change. And so they're basically being, you know, the messenger. And you know what happens to messengers when people don't want to hear what they have to say. Um, in fact, many scientists have um, experienced um, attacks on them personally, um, reputationally, but some of them including threats to their lives. So this is, I'm, I'm you know, just saying this is not the, the common thing, but it is certainly happening. All of this is to say we have not been prepared in graduate school, in our technical trainings, in our professional preparedness for dealing with the emotional side of what it is like to live this work day to day. That challenge, in my mind, is one that, you know, if you think about what, what is coming, in what ways can we sort of characterize that, um, at least how it's visible, is that things are happening faster and faster. The idea of going back to some kind of normal, some kind of stability, that's passe. That's not going to happen. So we're going to have to constantly adjust, and that is something humans are not happy about. Um, much of that change is going to come in the form of traumatic experiences, as I just showed you. And whether we choose it or whether we're choosing not to act and then it's going to be imposed, we're going to have to deal with profoundly transformative change. And we're not doing that from the same place. So I want to emphasize that. If you are a white person and you are committed to this work, absolutely, you're, you, know, you want to do this. You want skills and, and need to deal with a constant traumatic and transformative change. And you come to this from a place of maybe relative stability, maybe relative um, privilege. You had resources, you have the education. It's a one, you know, and, and being confronted with those things are going to be, whoa, this is so unusual. If you're a person of color, you might have lived through generations of trauma already. And to you, actually, some of that change is like long overdue. And still, it is an added stressor on everything else you're already dealing with, that you might not have the right resources and, and uh, positions of power to deal with adequately. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is we come to this particular type of change or these types of changes from very, very different angles. OK, here comes the interactive part. I'm going to ask you to help us figure out what do we need to deal with this. So I'm going to ask you to pull out your phones and go to menti.com. Probably most of you brought your phones along. So open a, 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 um, a browser and put in menti.com. And then it's going to ask you to enter a code 
8440-4994. And I'll leave that up for a moment so you can get that. So this is a test question, um, just to get you all familiar with how this thing works, which is just asking you to choose your favorite creature in this aquarium. Seahorses, I'm with you. I am with you. <laughs> Okay, let me quickly see how I can get this to expand a little bit more. All right, <laughs> wonderful. So this is, this is just to, get, to warm you up. What I wanna do now is I'm gonna ask you in this next thing to actually think about a situation that you might have lived through when there was constant change. You know, whether it was over the course of months or the course in a day of you just couldn't count on anything being stable or remembering what it was like. So just enter any number of words. I think you have um, the permission to enter more than one. Dread, exhaustion. You feel lost. Yes, that is what that's like. So I'm gonna move you to the next one. This, you know, if you want to, you can stay. But so imagine now you, ha you need skills to deal with that. Like what you just saw, uncertainty and constant change. What, what would help you? What kind of capacities and skills would help you to deal with that kind of change? An open mind, patience, balance, creativity, compassion, family, yoga, listening skills. Adaptability, kindness, oh, thank you. Grace, strength, love. Yep, you're on to something. That's what we need. Groundedness, courage, caring, perseverance, empathy, charity, resources, good luck. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's exactly right, that's what we need. So I'm gonna take you to the next question to just keep going. Now think about what it's like to live through trauma. Any of those events that I showed you pictures of, what is it like? How would it feel like to live through that kind of experience? Anger, yes, scary. There are constant reminders of it, depression, hopelessness suffocating, worry, doom. Yeah. The fear is in there again. Anxiety, loss. Some things are similar to that constant change, but also some pretty distinct ones, right? That hopelessness that didn't show up in the first one, the exhaustion. Never-ending pain, numbing. Yeah, that's where we often go when it gets too hard. Dread, depression. So take a look at this, at this cloud here of what it's like and think about what does it take to deal with that? What kind of skills and capacities would you like to have to be able to deal with those kinds of events and challenges. Again, family, therapy, courage, solidarity, good friends, yep. Social support, support system, stability, kindness, communication, exactly right. Time, food, a good therapist, self-care habits. Yeah, and you don't start them that day, right? <laughs> you better have them before that. Patience, financial assistance. So you see some things that you can, you can build yourself and you can start building them ahead of time and some things you are dependent on from other people, right? Support or financial resources. 
That comes from others, community, trying to find a sun ray, something that you can, some measure of hope in that moment. Yes. Okay, so one more, a couple more here. I'm gonna to turn to transformative change. What is it like when you become something or you live through something that it, when you start is one way and when you've finished is unrecognizable and irreversibly different than what was there before? Yes, it can be exciting. Like a butterfly, exactly, coming through the cocoon, right? It becomes mush before it becomes a butterfly. What do you need to be okay with being mush? <laughs> joy, metamorphic, yes. Resiliency, joy. It is scary too when you don't know what you're becoming because transformation is not predictable. What comes out of that, you know, the bug that goes into the cocoon, it's the first time they do it. They don't know. They didn't have anybody tell them, you're going to come out a nice butterfly. <laughs> Acceptance, letting go. Very good. Yes, exactly. Yes. Openness to new beginnings, those are in there. So an interesting mix, right, from the other ones before. There is some positive possibilities with transformation, but it is not easy. So what skills do we need for going through that profound kind of change? Fundamental. Listening, healing, patience, strength, support from mentors, creativity, an open mind, again, community, care, camaraderie, detachment from the past. How easy is it for you to let go of what you've always been, what you've always had, right? That's what giving up privilege might entail, that you don't have that. Moving on, so that's you can continue to add to this if you want. I'm just gonna, you get the idea that what is needed. So thank you very much for contributing um, to that. I'm gonna share with you later how we're actually, um, how we're benefiting from that for something called the Adaptive Mind Project. Because I'm not just gonna sit here and watch my colleagues burn out. We actually are in the process now of developing something uh, if you will, a leadership development um, initiative, a capacity building initiative that tries to help people build the very skills that you just all listed. That tries to help the professionals who don't necessarily learn that in graduate school to build the skills so they're better able to cope with it themselves and stop perpetuating trauma and pain on other people and at the same time become leaders and facilitators, if you will, of transformative change. That's, that's the hope, that's what we're trying to do. And I just wanna, I'll, I'll point it out in a moment. Um, there's one colleague here of our team in the audience, so I'll come back to that in a moment. But who is this for? For all the people that I, I showed you pictures of, from scientists to advocates, people who work in local government, um, journalists, elected officials, planners, educators, young people, extension agents. Um, I'm working with some psychologists. I just um, completed some work with spiritual leaders. So people who consider themselves as working and living on the front lines of climate change and who are already experiencing the emotional burden that I sh shared with you and who need help. So this is the team um, I pulled together a team of nine people um, all together that have expertise in both the psychology of this and the, the you know, various aspects of um, the situation that um, adaptation professionals and climate professionals find themselves in, but is also people who um, have linkages to networks of adaptation professionals. So we have, for example, someone who worked for um, NOAA Sea Grant, um, my colleague, 
Kristen Goodrich is um, from the Tijuana River National Estuary Research Reserve. Um, she is one of the team, and so she has access to that particular uh, network and of reserves um, around the country. Um, and she'll be working with me here in California. Um, so this is the team that you know began to build. What does this look like to help people um, who who are faced with these issues? What we, when we started, our, if you will, our theory of change was, well, we're gonna get some funding, we're gonna assess what's known about this, we're gonna you know, assess the needs of those adaptation professionals, get a really good sense of what people are actually needing, what skills they need, then we're gonna develop some training workshops, test them out, get, make them better, and by the end of whatever three years we might have, uh, like a, a prototype that we could then come up with scaling. Well, that was when we thought we might actually get money to do that. Turns out we didn't get any money, but we did it anyway, <laughs> because um, it just felt like you know that the needs came to us all the time. And so Kristen and I, in particular, worked on this needs assessment, doing surveys of the very people that I introduced you to to see what is it like for you. Tell us, you know, these were just anecdotes. Can we say something? And one of the things we found when we asked a very generic question, just about have you ever experienced burnout? 80% said yes. Now ever is a long time, right? <laughs> some of them have been on their jobs for a very short amount of time. Um, some of them for 30 years. Interestingly enough, this amount of burnout, when I started to hear about it, was 10 years after Al Gore um, put out his movie. It seemed to, at that moment, people began to realize we need to change from you know, just dealing with mitigation with a reduction of, of greenhouse gases. We also need to deal with the impacts. And 10 years after that, it seemed like people hit this, this zone of burnout. Now, is 80% a lot? Well, in the US, we have a burnout crisis more generally. And in a Gallup poll in 2019, um, we heard or learned that about 67% of the American public thinks that. So there's something slightly different about adaptation professional, professionals, right? There is a higher rate of burnout. We ask them why, what's going on? What, what are the stresses in your job? The urgency of the climate crisis connected with the sense that they're never doing enough fast enough Doing that in a racialized context, right? Being a white person often um, in a context of you know, working in, in communities that have been experiencing racism and exclusion for the longest period of time. Um, and just having to learn, how do I do that well? You know, we're all on that learning curve right, right now, right? But doing that against the, the clock ticking, if you will, with climate change, and then being faced with barriers of bureaucracy and, and no funding. So I'm gonna show you, this is my, my one um, truly scientific graph here for you. Um, <laughs> I gotta include one, and that is from where we ask people, how often do you experience certain kinds of things? So the first question on the left-hand side here is, um, we ask them to say how often they experience being emotionally exhausted from the topics they address in their work. The darkest colors are, the darker the color, the more often they feel that. So on that column, 50% experience feeling emotionally exhausted at least once a month. Now, why is that? The work I do is not enough to address climate change. That's a much larger number of people who have that experience, right? It gets darker blue, if you will. And then at the same time, people feel determined to succeed in their work because of of what I know about climate change and the potential impacts. How can you ever go on a vacation if you feel on the one hand, I'm not doing enough, we're not moving fast enough, the urgency is huge, and I'm determined to help my community succeed in this? You can't, right? That is probably a big part of why people are burning out. The first thing when we ask people, what do you want, is just for that to be acknowledged and for, for their emotions about that, their emotional response to this kind of situation to actually be something they can talk about. That was the first um, need. And then they need options, they need strategies, they need solutions, they need perspective, they need to help self-care. What, what are the practices, what do we do? Well, 
in that immediate need, we just put together um, a number of um, resources just you know, here. This is where you can go. Do what, whatever you can. That was the first response we had. It's clearly not enough. But people were asking, what can I do immediately? That's the thing on the left. And on the right, where do I find a climate-aware psychologist? Where can I take, take my, my experience and talk to somebody who knows what, what I'm talking about? Well, I made a whole other long list for them on that one. And that list is fortunately growing rapidly. But we felt that was not enough. You know, Just handing people a couple of handouts, and that's not good enough. So what we decided to do is that we needed, and it was always the plan, to basically develop training workshops or, or some kind of resource that is not on the clinical end. You know, we're not trying to be sort of pseudo psychologists, right? We're not trying to re um, replace that kind of support, but we wanted to educate people. We wanted to engage them. We wanted to create a space in which people can talk about it and build the skills to prevent their burnout rather than just be on the, you know, by the time they need crisis assistance, right? That, that's somebody else's job. But the demand for that came far faster than we were actually getting funding. I, I list here below um, a number of people um, who have provided some funding, but that funding was all you know, teaspoon sized, um, let me put it that way. Um, not insignificant, but nothing commensurate with what we had in mind. And so we basically decided we had to change our course. We had to essentially pull together our best wisdom and experiences from all the other work that everyone on the team had done, jump in, put something together, pilot something, learn as fast as we can, and then you know, essentially put the theoretical foundation underneath us when we did get the money. We finally did get enough funding this fall um, to have an expert workshop on the topic, um, which was very helpful in actually helping us reframe and, and rethink some of our approaches, which is already embedded in what you're now hearing. But that's the, the basic idea that we, you know, we, we just basically tried something out, and that's what we have been doing. Um, and in fact, what you see here is a list of organizations that have come to us um, either to just get a little taste of it, you know, a couple hours worth of it, or getting the uh, like one workshop. Um, one of the groups on here, the BTS Center, which is a place for spiritual leaders um, who wanted this kind of training. With them, we've just gone through a full training. And others at conferences, we give workshops to just kind of have um, some kind of, um, you know, get people excited about it. Um, and as you can see on the right, there's lots of interest from federal agencies. They're all burning out. Um, it's a really big crisis in many of these agencies, particularly the EPA. So what do we mean by the adaptive mind? What is that? Um, and I'm going to give you a evolving understanding and definition just to give you a sense of what we mean. So it's intentionally cultivated propensities, practices, and capacities. It's going to be a mouthful, so stay tuned for the rest of the sentence here, that are held by both individuals, but not only individuals. It is in the community. It is not just about individuals. So held by and between individuals to work to prevent minimize and respond with all kinds of um, skills, agility, creativity, resolve, you all name those, stamina, skillfulness, resilience, hope, and humility, to deal with the shocks and stresses that come with constant traumatic and transformative change. So that's, that's the you know, basic idea. I'll speak more about what those skills are. And you might say, well, adaptive mind, is that really enough? Well, it turns out that what people need is, yes, something related to how people think about it, but it's also what they feel. And those feelings live in their bodies. A lot of it is about self-care um, in people's bodies. And people have deep needs to be connected to deep meaning, their inner compass and maybe whatever their, their wider spiritual connection is. So it's, it's about the individual and how they're held in community. So that our focus is on, on that that combination of the individual in community. We believe that if we all just taught individuals and they all go home and they never talk to anybody else, it would probably would not, not persist, right? People need each other. Um, and so I put this little quote here on the right, shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we fail people. It's really important that we democratize this, if you will, if we, if we and publicize it, come out of the taboo of never being able to talk about that. 
And then, of course, the question is, where, where should we focus? Um, because the problems are so immense, right? On the one hand, it's, it, if you will, just think about just the downstream, the daily um, you know, set of challenges of dealing with this constant, comp complex, and chaotic type of change. But is that enough? Or should we maybe focus a little bit higher up on really helping people heal and um, per stop at least perpetuating trauma and pain, particularly that held? Um, among people uh, in communities? Or should we work much more upstream and, and think about why is it that we even get to this place? Well, our biggest frame actually is a transformative change framework uh, in which we're holding this particular work. But unfortunately, we can't avoid the other pieces. They're, they're a package deal in my mind um, in what we're facing. We're integrating a whole number of different bodies of work, um, drawing on nature and earth-based wisdom, as well as systems thinking and eco-relational ways of um, understanding how everything is connected. We're drawing on many different types of psychologies and are making as much as we can um, this an anti-racist and restorative justice frame um, to, to integrate deeply in the work that we do. The training cycle that we've developed that is actually a four-part training has four sessions that are each two days long. Um, and the first one is just simply to arrive and restore and reconnect with self and with others and nature. Um, you see here a picture from one of the workshops in which we uh, give people a surprise opportunity to nap. Do you know how, how unfamiliar people are with that? The specific goals at that moment is just simply <laughs> To, to help people like discover in what places they already have skills around um, the adaptive mind and also identify where they might want to build their strengths. So they just experience the tools that we have pulled together um, and, and start to build community among them. In the second one is where we really deepen into the, the emotional work that is not allowed in most people's workplaces. So that's where they experience and build additional skills, but it's really still more about experiencing, taking in, and, and finding finally a place in a trusted community um, to let them out. In the se third session, we help to build the understanding, the way of thinking about wh what are we facing here? What is going on? And for people to simply recognize the, the treadmill that they're in, if you will. So there it's more about reflecting on the tools and learning about them, understanding the rationale. And in the last session, we help people, if you will, apprentice or um, use some of the tools so that they can take them home back into the places of work or the communities that they work with. Um, so that's we've just gone through this once um, with one group and we'll continue to evolve it with every group. But it's a I can only tell you from this most recent um, experience how profoundly it changed people um, to simply go through this process over the course of nine months or so um, and to learn some of these skills. So what are we teaching? We're, what we're teaching is, you know, I call them adaptive mind skills, but really, ultimately, it is, it is actually how we might still become the wise human beings that our name apparently says we already are. And you might have a question about that. Some of them are related to the head, if you will, um, just framing, understanding, learning what, what's happening, having a space for sense making, and learning to communicate, mediate, resolve conflicts, because these types of change involve a lot of conflict. Um, but it is also about having space for feelings and, and becoming comfortable having them in the circle of a trusted uh, community. So clarifying your values, connecting with others, not feeling so alone with that. Grounding, caring, resting, healing. So this is all very trauma-informed um, in that. But people don't want to just feel and think. People want to do something. And so it is really also about helping people, what can you do differently than you did before? And what are my assets um, that I'm bringing to this? People feel the, some of the biggest pain for people is when they do not act in accordance with their values. So this piece around feet is around engaging and walking the talk, having that integrity, um, being you know, not internally divided. And then there's that transpersonal um, connection, um, both with connecting with purpose, inner compass, 
but also maintaining spiritual anchors and connections uh, and practices. So that's really the, the heart of it. And what you just all offered in your responses to the Menti poll um, is actually where this comes from. Um, we've asked this question, the, the same questions that we gave you to many, many other audiences, and they are consistent. They're, every audience, regardless of where it is, has given pretty much these answers. So um, you are helping us very much build this bridge as we walk on it. So my last slide, um, where is this going? What are we hoping? Well, we're hoping to actually find a, a model that at least sustains us, if you will, um, that allows us to grow the community of climate professionals and leaders really placed anywhere and everywhere. Um, people who work on the front lines of climate change, who have the psychological skill capacities and the support from peers and institutions to honestly, compassionately and effectively face what we're facing and to um, be effective in assisting the necessary healing and transformative changes that we need to move to a more just and livable world. So with that, thank you very much. And I hope we have still some time for questions. Thank you, Susie. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lot to think and feel about. <laughs> questions, anyone? This brings to mind a wonderful trip that Walter and I took to the Vatican with Ramanathan. And it was the um, Pontifical Academy of scientists and, and the Pontifical Academy of Social Scientists meeting together for the very first time. And I can tell you that the biggest takeaway from the meeting, other than the fact that out of it came the environmental um, papal statement, was the fact that the social scientists had no use for the scientists because they felt the scientists had the easy job, but the social scientists had to communicate it and change people's behaviors. Yeah, it's very true. Um, I think I'm, I'm not quite in the camp of, of saying we don't need the physical scientists, um, but it is oftentimes the people who are the, you know, the communicators who are the, that what are meant by the public face, right? They're the ones who need to interact with the community and, and help find solutions, so. Yes, we need both, and we need to be able to communicate with each other across those disciplinary lines. Yes. Hi, I, I teach, um, I'm a teacher, and I, I teach political science, and <clears throat> I'm trying to encourage my fellow social scientists to begin to teach more about these kinds of, of issues that face us, not just from a scientific perspective, but from these others. But one of the tools that I found very um, helpful I wanted to ask you about is fiction. Just reading climate fiction, people imagining what a future might look like, I have found very therapeutic. So I wanted to see what you thought about that. Yeah, it's a great comment. Um, we, in the Adaptive Mind workshops, we use um, mostly poetry, but um, we actually exchange lists of fiction um, for the very reason that you mentioned. Um, because you know we are so imagination challenged, right? And we cannot. Um, actually imagine that there is a future that's not just a doom kind of future. Um, but in the context of thinking about what, where does hope come from and where does it come in and what kind of hope do we need? Um, one of the most important things that people um, learn in our training is that if you're absolutely certain it's gonna be all doom, you just don't do anything. You don't need to do anything, right? It's gonna be bad. If you're absolutely certain we're gonna be fine, you don't need hope, it's all gonna be fine. You need hope in the middle, in the place where you're uncertain. In fact, I think uncertainty is an essential ingredient for hope to actually emerge and for it to be necessary. And then you need to have a really worthy goal to go for, and that requires imagination. So, um, you know, people who can help us sort of think um, out of the box of our very narrow minds, I think is a really helpful way to open up that space and to make it more uncertain, right? And that's when we can, with agency, step in and actually create maybe a future that's very different. So thank you for that comment, yeah. I'm a high school teacher. I'm right. <laughs> Hi, I'm a high school teacher, and so I deal with a lot of the 
um, students coming in with a lot of anxiety about um, climate change and about what their future is going to look like. Um, one of my techniques that I often use is I try to bring from across as many fields as I can the amazing things that people are doing and also what I've seen over 20 years of teaching climate change, um, the hope that I see because things have changed in many ways much faster than we thought they were going to. And I just wanted to know where, wh how does that figure in your calculus of like collecting all the things that people are doing that are moving in some wonderful directions? Yeah, so I think there are you know, multiple places to, to take this. Um, and we don't tell people it's going to be this or that. We're going to, we ask people to grapple with it. So if people have, say, you know, like the spiritual leaders, they were less grounded in the climate science and all the possibilities that happen. So they get more of that. The people who deal with that on a daily basis in their technical jobs, they get more of the psychological side. So, you know, we balance that out a little bit. Um, but in terms of you know, what, what space does it open up? Certainly possibility um, and, you know, lots of people who model what we can do with different kinds of solutions are basically saying, yeah, we have all the possibilities, we just don't have the political will. And that's one place that many of them actually um, deal with on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, th this is, I guess what I want to say is we, we try to create a space in which we don't fall into the easy answers because that's probably the most juicy and generative place we can be, right? Holding the tension between it could be th this and it could be that without giving answers, because who has the answer? All we get is, is opinions. <laughs> no one has the answer to this. It's what shoulder we're gonna put against you know, the wheel, right? And, and how sustained are we gonna push? Um, I always think you know, COVID showed us how fast we can change and how little stamina we have, right? I'm surprised to see as many masks here as, as we're having. Um, most places I go now, it's over, we're done, right? There's still a thousand people dying every day in America. That's a lot. So I guess to me it's, can we stick with the not knowing? And from that place source, how do we wanna live with that not knowing? What's worth getting up for in the morning? And diving into that depth is what I think most people are, were most grateful for in this training that we just completed. Having an opportunity to think about that deep question. When you're in constant like, you know, work, 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 you don't think about that. You don't have time for it. So having a space for that conversation to happen is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, so I'm a student uh, here at Scripps in both marine biology and political science. So, Excellent uh, someone combo. Who's, <laughs> thank you. It was, um, I really appreciated everything you said about how both fields tie together because I think a lot of times it's um, kind of this debate of like, oh, science says this, politics says this. But what would your advice be to someone going into those fields um, as someone who's interested in marine conservation or climate change? How would you say... Um, yeah, what would your advice be to someone going into that to um, really understand the issue, but also to start to make some of these changes? These changes meaning? Meaning like in the, the way that we're looking at climate change. Um, how would you advise someone going into that? Like you talked about burnout and that sort of thing. How would you advise um, against, I guess, ending up in that situation? Well, so the great advantage you have is obviously that you're learning about the physical systems and about social sh systems and how they change, right? So one of the most important things I've learned over my own career, I would say, is that um, when I tried to, you know, I used to train people in, in how to talk about climate science and climate change. And at some point I just changed. I just let that be, not because it's unimportant for people to know about climate change. It's wonderful, please. If we all had PhDs in it, it I'd be really appreciative. But that's not the case. And what people seem to need more is to know how social change happens. And so I began teaching about social change because most people don't know how you can make change through the political system or where the barriers are and where they can you know, enter and, and, and push the lever, if you will. So that's one piece. The other one is that most people feel really alone with whatever reactions they have to what I presented to you because it's not common to talk about that. You know, and so encouraging people to normalize that 
we actually, probably most of us in, the, in an office might have those feelings, even if we never talk about it, create a space for that to be able to happen and invite that. It changes the culture of the place if you have that op opportunity. And people will, you know, people don't like to just hang out in, in their own doom and gloom, right? But they need to say it and from that go forward with a whole new energy because they're seen, they're heard. And then they have, actually, they're not using their energy to repress whatever emotions they have. They have it freely available to do something. So then it, it becomes possible to actually look at the situation in a new way and learn about how change happens and, and do whatever is meaningful. So people ask me this all the time, what can I do? You know, and I, I say, tell me what excites you. What's the most thing that, that is you're most passionate about? And is it, if it's, I don't know, if you have a knitting circle, you know, wonderful. Do that for climate change. Why? Because it creates social relations. And social relations is what we have learned from archaeology and history, what is the one decisive factor that helps societies not collapse. Having functional relations that you know, still allow us to make decisions together, most essential. So anything you can do to maintain trusted relationships and, and foster conversation and help people understand how they can help with the change, that would be my recommendation. So thank you so much to everyone.